Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We have a guest for you today who is the author of the book called Think Simple. And uh, this book portrays the experience of Mr. Ken Siegel, who had worked with uh, Stephen Jobs for a while. And I understand that uh, uh, Mr. Siegel had worked with uh, Mr. Stephen Jobs for 12 years, uh, ever since the next days prior to the Apple days. And uh, this uh, book, Think Simple, is published by NHK Publications. And uh, it does have a uh, subtitle saying, Insanely Simple, The Obsession That Drives Apple's Success. And uh, Mr. Siegel is going to make a presentation using the uh, PowerPoint. And uh, this is really a rare opportunity for every one of us. So I ask uh, to engage in very active discussions later on. Uh, interpreter is Ms. Ikeda from Simon International. And I am the MC for you, who is from the Japan National Press Club. I am Sugita uh, from uh, Kyodo News Agency. My turn? Please. Well. Hello, uh, thank you for coming. I am very honored to be in Japan. It's the first time I've been here since the year 2000 when there was a Macworld presentation and Steve Jobs came uh, and my ad agency came as part of that effort. And I uh, noticed at that time that there were actually people camping out overnight to hear Steve talk. Um, and it is interesting to me that I have yet to see a single person camping out to see me talk. So the reason I'm here, as everyone has, uh, as I have been introduced, is that I wrote this book. And it was actually something that was uh, in my mind for quite a few years. Uh, but I finally got around to doing it. And it went on sale in the US last month and uh, very quickly became a New York Times bestseller, which is a very exciting and unexpected thing for me. So the story for me really starts back in 1997 when Steve Jobs came back to Apple. And this is a, a famous cover of Wired magazine, uh, which indicated the seriousness of the situation for Apple. As Steve would say in later years, Apple was 90 days away from bankruptcy. So the amazing thing is that just 14 years after the company was about to go out of business, uh, on August 10th, 2011, Apple became the most valuable company on Earth. And it's Apple's ability to rise from the ashes and become such a successful company that raises a lot of questions in people's minds about how that happened. And that's what my book is really about. My theory is that despite, the, uh, in addition to the engineers and designers and all the people who have made Apple success, there's an overriding value that influences all of them in their work. So just give you a little background on me so you don't think uh, I'm just somebody who walked in off the street. Um, my story is that I do have a past with Steve Jobs. I worked with him for a little over 12 years altogether. Uh, the most uh, memorable years were the ones when he came back to Apple in 1997 and started to rebuild the company. But I also worked with him, as was mentioned, uh, back at Next when he was driven out of Apple in 1985. I joined up with him around 1987 and uh, did all the advertising for Next. And that's when I formed my relationship with Steve. But I also have these uh, experience with these other companies. And to be honest, part of the inspiration of my, for my book was my experience with these other companies because after I worked with Apple, I was pretty stunned with how complicated these other companies were. And it seemed to me that that was one of the big reasons why they didn't achieve success on the level of Apple. So the first thing we did as an ad agency for Steve when he came back to Apple was create this Think Different campaign. And the reason we did that was because there, would, there was no new product. When Steve walked in the door, it would be at least six months before we'd have anything new to share. So what Steve wanted to do is create this campaign that would explain to people that Apple was alive and well and its imagination was as active as ever, and great things were to come. There was a commercial we did that launched this campaign that was very um, emotional for, for Steve. It was all about the people that Apple admired, and it included people like Albert Einstein, but it had all kinds of people in arts and sciences. And it was very, very important to Steve because it, was, it captured 
what he believed was the essence of Apple. And interestingly, uh, when Steve died, uh, about two weeks after that, when they had a memorial for Steve, his youngest daughter, who was 10 years old, got up and said, I would like to read one of dad's favorite poems. And she read the words to this commercial, which was a very uh, emotional moment for all of us who had anything to do with it, because we knew Steve loved it, but never imagined it would be spoken as a tribute to him after he died. And uh, the, the, the next big moment uh, in my time with Steve was this little thing called the eye, which um, was something that uh, I came up with this name for iMac, never really imagining what the eye was going to turn into. But uh, it was a fun little exercise because the truth is Steve Jobs did not like the name iMac when he first heard it. In fact, he didn't like it the second time he heard it. And it took some pushing before he finally started listening to the opinions of those around him and thought, yeah, maybe that is a good name after all. And obviously now we have I things everywhere you look. So the I is a very, very good example of simplicity at work because it doesn't get much simpler than a single character from the English alphabet. But this idea of simplicity really pervades everything that Apple does. And this is uh, an image that I love because it really, uh, it really points out the difference between Apple's philosophy and, and other companies. And this is a Sony remote control for a television and an Apple remote control. But the, this philosophy of simplicity really doesn't just apply to Apple's products. It really applies to the whole company. And that came from Steve Jobs. It's really, uh, it's in the way they work. It's in the processes. It's in the way they, they think. It's in the way they uh, approve products or, or their lack of committees and all these things that they do to make things simpler inside the company, which really ends up uh, producing simpler products. Now, many people try to explain Apple's success, and Steve Jobs himself would do it when he would stand up at these presentations. And he would often say, it's not just me. We have thousands of brilliant people at Apple. We have engineers and designers and marketers and all kinds of, of great people. But the truth is, there are a lot of smart people in the world, and there are a lot of smart companies. There must be something different about the way Apple works versus the way other companies work. And I think I actually figured it out. After 20 or 30 years working between Apple and these other companies, it really struck me, and, and that's why I felt the, the uh, need to write the book, but it really boils down to one simple thing, and that is that Apple keeps things simple, and other companies let things get complicated. I think a lot of it is in the processes. I think every company has a good intention, and as they succeed, they create these processes to make sure they can repeat their successes. But over a number of years, people start focusing more on the processes than the, idea, than the ideas that flow through them. And Apple is extremely good at protecting the ideas and not letting people put their priorities in the wrong place. So an important point that I make from the start is that being simple isn't simple. The problem with simple things is that they, they often look obvious or they look like, well, anyone could have thought of that. But in fact, obviously, it isn't that simple to build an iPhone or an iPad. But you need to have uh, an organization that supports simplicity so you can create great ideas, but then you need to have the ability to protect ideas, and Apple is very, very good at that. Simplicity needs a champion, and obviously at Apple it was Steve Jobs and his designated people who, who would uh, carry forth uh, the, the mission and uh, keep the people who are working sensitive to the fact that Simplicity must be their, their guiding value. So in my experience, simplicity is really the product of brains and common sense. And I think the world generally gives Steve Jobs credit for being this great visionary and having these revolutionary ideas. Um, 
But I worked with him on a, on a day-to-day basis, and what I found to be his most compelling attribute was his ability to use common sense, especially when I worked with other companies, and you'd be in a meeting where everyone pretty much thought we should do it one way versus another way, but there were all these complicating factors that people end up being influenced by, whereas in the Steve Jobs world, he would act with, uh, with swiftness and sometimes with anger, <laughs> Uh, to put it nicely, when people, when he sensed that people just weren't using their common sense. Simplicity is one of the few things in this world that comes with a guarantee. It's actually foolproof, it's rock solid, and it never fails. And I believe that's because uh, of several reasons. One is that it's not a trend. It is something that is a permanent part of the human condition. <laughs> We all prefer things that are simpler. You could go down to your local bookstore and find all kinds of management ideas that are, for the most part, trends and will be replaced next year by another trend. Simplicity is a forever thing. It's been a part of human nature uh, since the dawn of time. Simplicity is is something that's not even debatable. It's really a fact of life, and that's because it's burnt into the the DNA of every human being. In fact, I believe it's built into the DNA of every living creature Mm -hmm. in that you could put a bone five feet in front of a dog and then another one up a flight of stairs and your dog will, of course, go for the one that's easiest to get to. I think every intelligent human being would prefer to accomplish the same result in a simpler way than a more complicated way. And last, I think that simplicity is a universal preference. It, it knows no cultural boundaries. As I said, it's part of being human, so it, it really works anywhere, anytime, any place. Now, the real problem comes uh, when, when you realize that there actually is this dark force called complexity, and wherever simplicity goes, complexity is soon to follow. Now, Steve Jobs was amazingly good at two things. One, he was a champion of simplicity and encouraged it and demanded it, but he was also intolerant of complexity, and that's when his tougher side came out and he would quash uh, any behavior that he, that he believed uh, was promoting complexity. Now, there are many things that are part of complexity, such as meetings, We all have meetings and we all need to have meetings, they're important, but we've also been to meetings that are too large or too frequent um, or uh, just too out of control and without purpose. So uh, Steve was very good at keeping meetings small and purposeful, but there are other things too as well as research and analyses that obviously is necessary as well, but it can create complicating considerations and again you need to have the good sense to keep these things under control. There are opinions, there are naysayers, there are competitors whose actions influence yours, and current events which, which change our lives as well. Now this is a, 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 little, a very brief video I wanted to share, uh, which just became available a couple of weeks ago. It's from the, uh, the Museum of, Cut- of Computer History near San Francisco, and it's an old, old, video of Steve Jobs speaking in 1980 when he was 25 years old and uh, he was speaking about the name Apple and why he believed that was a good name for the company. I should also warn you beforehand this is a very old video as I said and there's one moment and there are a lot of glitches in it poor quality and there's one moment where the sound disappears but it won't uh, prevent you from understanding what uh, Steve's point was. But we re-examined it on a regular basis, and we found that the juxtaposition of something that seemed to epitomize what we were going after, which was the simplicity and yet very refined sophistication. We've seen our first brochure, probably some of you have it, the title of it was Simplicity is the Ultimate Sophistication. And that wasn't just a, a bullshit slogan, it actually was really what 
we've been striving for. And uh, the apple seems to symbolize that. So I think we're going to stick with it. <laughs> What's interesting to me seeing that video clip is that Steve, when he was 25 years old, was almost exactly like he was when he was 50 years old. Mm -hmm. He really, really never changed his, his way of speaking. And uh, he was just a really interesting person. And, and it's interesting that he was uh, that way back then. But what he was saying there was that the name Apple was the juxtaposition of simplicity and very re refined sophistication. And this is the brochure that he was referring to. Uh, the headline was, Simplicity is the Ultimate Sophistication. What's interesting to me is that you could put those words on any product that Apple has ever built, from the first Apple II computer to today's iPad. It's about simplicity and sophistication. So in my book, I talk about the ten elements of simplicity. I, I just tried to organize them, all the things I learned working with Steve, into ten categories that would make it easier to talk about. And I won't go through all of them now, but I just want to share a couple with you so you'd get the uh, sense of what I'm talking about. And the first one is the idea of thinking small. Steve Jobs spoke in 2010 at a digital conference in California, and he said this in passing, which became one of my favorite quotes of his. <clears throat> he said, you know how many committees we have at Apple? Zero. We're organized like a startup. We're the biggest startup on the planet. I think Steve's goal was to preserve the spirit of a startup uh, even as Apple got bigger and bigger and became a globally uh, important company. They certainly have operations that, that must function like a big company, but when it comes to the creating of, of ideas and the way management works with uh, the different groups within Apple, they have held on to this entrepreneurial spirit. I don't think Steve ever forgot those days in the garage because as Apple got bigger and bigger, this remained his most important organizational uh, element, which was the small groups of smart people. He didn't allow large groups to work on things. He wanted really smart people working together, being responsible for something, creating something at the end, and not feeling like a cog in a wheel. I should point out that Steve was rather extreme in the way he executed these ideas, and that the key word here is really smart, because it really doesn't work very well if you don't have the most brilliant people in place, because a small group of people isn't as powerful as a small group of smart people. This is the simplest slide I have to share and the most unimaginative for which I apologize, but I think it actually conveys Apple's philosophy in a very good way as well, which is they get from point A to point B in a straight line. And when you work with these other companies and when you see how many outside forces make that line get less straight or interrupt it completely, uh, Apple is just incredibly good at having an idea, executing it, and creating a product without letting outside forces impact that idea. One of those outside forces that Steve did not want to influence the workings of Apple was the opinions of his customers. Now, that sounds very arrogant, but a lot of companies create products based on what their customers tell them they want. And Steve didn't care what his customers wanted, and again, that sounds arrogant, but it wasn't. Steve believed that it was Apple's job to create things that his customers could never imagine. Mm. So he thought it made no sense to ask them what they want <laughs> because it was their job to come up with great ideas mm -hmm. so that once his customers saw these things, then they would want them. Mm. To make that point more clear, Steve would often quote Henry Ford, who created the first automobile, who was asked a question and answered, if I asked people what they wanted, they'd say, a faster horse. <laughs> so the next point is uh, about minimizing. And this picture epitomizes that to me, which is uh, one company's vision of how a mouse should work and Apple's vision, which of course has no buttons at all, although it does have the functions of a left click and a right click and a scroll wheel, 
it doesn't appear to have any buttons whatsoever. Now, this same principle of, of minimizing their product features also applies to the way Apple communicates with its customers and the way it sells products to its customers. This is just another example of how simplicity pervades all the things that Apple does. As an example, I use this, which is if you were looking for a laptop computer, you could go to Dell and find 19 different models of laptops. You could go to HP and find 49 distinct versions of a laptop. Mm. Or you could go to Apple and see five. Mm. This is called product proliferation, and most companies are, uh, find it difficult to resist. They mm. feel like if they make more products and give their customers more choices, mm. they will be able to sell more products. Mm. Interestingly, Apple does not take that approach, and they end up making more money than all the other guys combined. Mm. Interestingly, when Steve came to, back to Apple in 1997, Apple itself had fallen into the trap of product proliferation. Apple had not been profitable for quite a long time before Steve returned, and this was one of the reasons. They had over 20 product models that they had to support with R&D, and with marketing, and it really splintered Apple's resources. And the press was there. Everyone was very excited to see what the first computer from Steve was going to be after he had returned. And uh, the iMac unveiling was an important event, but, but something else happened at that same show before he unveiled the iMac that I and many others believe was probably more important than the unveiling of the iMac itself. So what he did was he put up a, a graphic that, it, that described the new product lineup for Apple. And he said, I am getting rid of 20 some odd models. We are blowing up our whole product line and we're only going to sell four things. And iMac was going to fill in that space. There was the, excuse me, the home and PC would have a model for a desktop and laptop. iMac was going to fill in the space for the home desktop. And the only one that was blank at that point was the home laptop. And although Apple is well known for its secrecy, he stood on the stage that day and said, that's what we're working on. We're going to fill in that last hole in our product lineup, and Apple is going to devote all of its resources to doing four things really, really well. Another uh, important uh, part of being simple is, is thinking human. And it's interesting that when Steve did come back and create this first campaign for Apple to con convince people that Apple was a great technology company, the last thing he talked about was technology. Mm -hmm. What he did do was run this Think Different campaign, which celebrated human achievement and never showed a computer. It was Steve's way of, of bonding with people and, and saying, these are the things we believe in, and if, if you believe in these things also, we're the company you should be thinking about. So an important part of being human is talking like a human. So this slide is entitled The Art of Human Speak, and really all I mean is that Apple established this way of talking to its customers long, long ago, back when the company started. They talk like a person, and if you look at a lot of the other technology companies today, you'll, you'll find lists of specifications and processor speeds and all that kind of thing. Apple would never do that. They believe that part of being simple is just talking in a very simple way to their customers. Mm. And actually, this isn't a new concept. All Steve was doing by, by believing these things was believing what Leonardo da Vinci himself once said, which was, one should use common words to explain uncommon things. Mm. My last point is about thinking casual. And this goes back to Steve's belief that, that acting like a startup was an important thing to do and resisting the temptations of acting like a big business was an important thing to do. So what he would do is encourage behavior. He wanted people to think big but act small. Steve did not like big company behavior because he thought that innovation was not born in a big company environment. So he insisted on doing things in a, in a casual way. He would have very informal presentations. He would just 
present off of a whiteboard. He would never have anything printed to hand out to people. Um, and in fact, as the legend goes, he, was, he would frequently take off his shoes and put his feet right up on the table when he was talking to you. I think the important thing for Apple is that simplicity forms a foundation of innovation. It's because they believe so thoroughly in the power of simplicity and organize their company that way that they can create these revolutions year after year after year. I think a lot of companies score big with one invention or another, but because it's not baked into their system to behave this way, it's difficult to repeat. Mm -hmm. And Apple has proven to the world over the last 15 years that operating this way can be an extremely uh, profitable and successful way to operate. So I mentioned that Steve resisted complexity. And anyone who wants to uh, leverage the power of simplicity does need to have the skill in defending against the dark or evil forces of complexity. And the way you do that, really, is by keeping the work confined to small groups of smart people. It's by remaining true to these human values, the way you speak and communicate. It's about minimizing the choices that you present to people or trying to put too many messages in a single communication. It's about really being crystal clear um, and about not being so formal and not getting so caught up in in the, form, the formal big company ways of working uh, and, and try to retain the, the spirit of a smaller company. Last, I wanted to share with you this quote from Steve, which is really my, my personal favorite of him, and I, it's actually in the back cover of my book, or it's somewhere in my book. <laughs> I forget what country I'm in. Mm -hmm. But um, this is just really, really an important one. Steve said, simple can be harder than complex. Mm -hmm. You have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple. But it's worth it in the end because once you get there, you can move mountains. Mm. And I think that's exactly what Apple proved, what Steve proved, is that he held on to these almost naive beliefs that a company could maintain these, this love of simplicity even as it got so ridiculously large. Um, and he managed to do it. And the success of Apple is proof of that.